Welcome everyone to the uh, New York Upstate Chapter 2020 Virtual Conference. This is the Harriet Tubman session and we will be starting shortly. Welcome again to everyone at the APA conference, New York Upstate Chapter 2020 virtual conference this year. We're going to start in just a few seconds. Well, welcome everyone. This is the fourth webinar of the APA Upstate Chapter Conference. I see we have our speaker with us today, Mike Long. And we will be uh, starting right now with a session on Harriet Tubman creating a national park for this hero of the Underground Railroad. Our speaker today is Mike Long and I'll introduce him in just a minute. My name is Marcia Keyes. My colleague Dan Harp and I are on the conference planning committee this year and we will be your host for this session. We would like to let you know that all sessions are being recorded and attendees will receive an email that will uh, provide a link to the chapter's YouTube account and that will be coming to you. 
Now today, all attendees are muted. So if you have any questions or comments, please submit them in the Q&A box. Dan and I will monitor, monitor the Q&A box and Mike has agreed to take, to take questions as we go along. And so we will try to interject them when appropriate. And he will also, of course, answer questions at the end of the session. This ses session is scheduled for 2.5 CM credits. The credit number, which is in the chat box, so you can find it, but it is 9205075. Again, that will be in the chat box. So our topic today is Harriet Tubman. Now, I'm sure you've all heard of Harriet Tubman, particularly if you're at this session, but how much do you really know about her life in central New York, where she purchased land and spent many years in her later life? Well, our speaker today, Mike Long, is an expert on Harriet Tubman and has spent many years of his life working on ways to purchase, to restore, to care for her properties in Auburn, as well as finding money and partners to do all of this work and to be sure her legacy is known to everyone nationwide. And what better way to do that than to have the site designated as a National Historical Park under the auspices of the National Park Service, uh, which was designated in 2017. And Mike is going to lead us through the steps that he took and that others took and many partners to get to that point. So a little bit about Mike first. I know his bio is online, but Mike has a long bio. And I'm gonna start with our chapter uh, connections. Mike, as many of you may know, has past president of the New York Upstate chapter, also past treasurer and currently officer emeritus. He was inducted in the last class into the most, uh, into the most recent class of the College of Fellows of the AICP, which is the highest honor in the planning profession. So once again, congratulations on that, Mike. Um, Thank you. Mike brings 40 years of experience at the local governmental level, including service as a professional planner with the city of Auburn, which we're going to hear a lot about today, but also with the Cayuga County Planning Board, as well as city manager of Oneonta and city administrator of Poughkeepsie, where he worked on the walkway over the Hudson State Historic Park. Uh, which opened in 2009. Mike's now moved to the private sector and in 2014 he created his consulting firm Finger Lakes Planning and Development. So Mike proposed the initial concept for the Harriet Tubman Park and has worked on the implementation of this for the last 30 plus years. So we're going to hear more about this right now. So Mike we will have you share your screen and you can get started. Okay, Marcia. Well, thank you very much for your wonderful introduction. And I wanna thank you and Dan for spending time putting together the uh, committee and, and working with all the different people on turning this into a virtual conference. Again, as many of you may know me, um, I love to talk about Harry Tubman. I've been involved with this project as, as Marcia said for, for 40 years. But first of all, I also wanna throw out a thank you to uh, BN Planning and Design for their sponsorship for this session. Uh, actually, I got to meet John when we were working on the comprehensive plan in Auburn back when this idea was just being germinated. So again, uh, fortunately uh, this year, um, we're not able to, but uh, at the conference, usually John says, let's get together and have a beer. Uh, so we can't do that this year, but hopefully next year we will be able to meet in person and do that, which is what I love about the conference most of all is getting together and networking with the different people that I've worked with over the last many decades. So as was mentioned, it's uh, two and a half hours of credit uh, time. So I'm gonna ramble on and on and on about different things. I have been told that I talk about different things and themes and threads and eventually I get back to the initial thought that I had, but sometimes it takes a few minutes to get there. So hopefully with some indulgence by all of you fine members, you'll take a, a understanding of trying to figure out the story and how this uh, national park process gets started and works underway. So uh, let's see what we can do and how am I gonna, uh, let's see. 
Today, I'm gonna to talk about the creation of the National Park for Harry Tubman, which is number 414 in terms of the overall country. Uh, again, it's a very prestigious thing to have a national park nominated in your name. But I, so as a historian, I like to talk about Harriet's history. And as Marcia indicated, many people have heard of Harriet in the Underground Railroad. I'll talk a little bit about her 50 plus years that she spent in Auburn, New York as well. Uh, and again, I think one of the other issues that I'm gonna try to blend into the conversation is talking about some of the national influences of the day. Uh, obviously the abolitionist movement, the Quakers who were very much involved with setting up the whole movement, and then the issue of slavery, the reason why the Civil War happened, and hopefully trying to connect some of the dots there as well. Part of the process, we'll also talk a little bit in more detail about the National Park legislative process, which uh, those of us who've worked at local government or state government understand how bills are adopted and proposed and influenced. Uh, on a national level, it's just a whole nother level. It's just unbelievable what you have to go through to go through that process. But hopefully I'll give you a small taste of, of what was involved with that. I'll give you a little bit of an overview of the grant activity. And I, at this point, I think um, I've done about $2 million worth of grants for the Harry Tubman home. The Harry Tubman home itself has also put another million dollars in, plus had a bunch of other uh, impacts from other organizations as well. And what I'll try to finish up with is what the economic impact of the community is. As you probably know, having a national park in your community or a state park or a historic site brings tourism. And New York State, tourism is the number two industry in the state of New York. Uh, the city of New York would be in deep trouble without it, so, uh, as well as upstate New York. So hopefully we'll be able to get into it. But so this is the culmination of 30 years of effort is the national signing, which happened, um, invited down to the Department of Interior and National Park number 414 was, was formed. Um, again, as you can see on the screen is Chuck Schumer, our U.S. Senator and U.S. Senator Kirsta Gillibrand. Uh, Schumer was instrumental in this whole process and was very much an active participant in the entire thing. Uh, crossing the aisle, John Katko, our Republican Congressman, was also the linchpin as to making this happen. Um, one thing I'll note is that it happened 10 days before the current president happened to take office. Uh, again, everyone was very worried about that, so we had to push hard in order to get all of the documents finally signed. And so you can see the signing ceremony that took place with the Secretary of the Interior. So that was really a, I don't think I call it a cornerstone project, but it's, it's something that I can look back and, and say that, you know, uh, it's been wonderful to be able to participate in the process and to see a lasting legacy as to something that you believe in. Uh, Reverend Carter, who is one of the um, principal players in this project, who's the resident manager, um, this project never would have got started off the ground without Reverend Carter. And he has a theme or a saying that he uses, says, and that's that he wants to uh, live for a, for a purpose, you know, rather than because. Um, just because of, you know, trying to get uh, a, a more money, a bigger job, but he likes to work on issues just because it's the right thing to do. And without Reverend Carter and his wife, Christine, we would have had a lot of roadblocks along the way. So hopefully what I can do is encourage some of the young planners who were able to participate and see this conference uh, to follow your dreams work on different projects. Um, I was very blessed that early in my career as an unemployed, just graduate from landscape architecture school with a degree in architecture, uh, became the draftsman in the planning department. And the Cuga County, they let me work on something I wanted to work on. And I knew I, I put my life into it. Uh, they didn't really care what I did as long as I got something done. And so this is how we get things finished. We keep working on stuff. So. I'll start with history. Who was Harriet Tubman? Well, really her name was not Harriet. It was Araminta Ross. Uh, she was born about 1822 in Bucktown, Maryland on the, the coast. Um, again, Kate Clifford Larson found some of the original information, but 
Minty was her original name. And her father was Ben Ross. He worked on the, and was owned by the Anthony Thompson Plantation. His skill was as a timber uh, hauler, uh, basically cutting limber, lumber out of the woods, and was also a boat builder. And so her father basically understood a lot about life, about uh, working with his hands, about being in the, in the wilderness, out in the wet area. Her mother was named Harriet, and they called her Grit, Grit Green, and she was owned by the Edward Brodus Plantation. And so they were basically owned by two different uh, families. And so again, it was kind of difficult because they lived in two different places. So the father lived on one place, the mother and the family lived on a different plantation. So, uh, but Minty was the middle of seven children. Uh, basically, uh, she was taking care of some of the younger people while her parents were the ones out working in the fields and in homes and things of that nature. But, so Minty had a, a huge impact. And eventually in 1844, she married a, a, a free uh, black man. His name was John Tubman. Um, as part of the taking of rights with the African Americans at the time, she then got to choose her own name. So she took her mother's name as Harriet and Tubman as her married name. So that is why we now know her as Harriet Tubman. Very interesting theme, you know, again, but what I'll try to talk about is also at the time, about 50% of the population in Maryland were free black and 50% were enslaved blacks. And uh, Reverend Carter always talks about there's a, a, a um, everyone is born free, but they are enslaved by society. So again, um, you may be a cultural norm, you know, this is how people are, are treated. And so they feel like they're owned or their property. Um, again, it's one of the themes that keeps coming up back and forth. But today, what I'll try to talk about are some of the early influences that had a big difference in terms of, of Minty's growing up. Um, again, her father working out in the swamps, and she would learn things from him, how to follow the stars, where the North Star is. And probably one of the most important things is, where does the moss grow on a tree? Uh, most of us landscape architects know it's always on the north side of the tree. But when you're out in the bayous and you're trying to work your way through the swamps, it's easy to, uh, at nighttime, to try to figure out exactly what direction you're going. But as a young child, you know, five, six, seven years old, one of her jobs was to set out the muskrat traps in the waters, trying to capture these, these muskrats. Um, again, the owners didn't want to do it, so send the kid out there. Uh, again, so you're waiting out in, you know, frigid water trying to set these traps. You have to go out and check them. So again, it was something that Minty was not very good at in uh, house work, um, taking care of dusting and taking care of the houses. She really was more set for working outdoors. So probably one of the biggest events that happened um, in Minty's young life was when she was about 12 or 13 years old, you see the general store pictured on the bottom of the screen. And so there was a um, overseer who was basically chasing down one of these runaway slaves. And Minty was in the store buying goods for the home. The overseer yells to Minty, hey, stop that kid, he's running away. You have to capture him. And Minty thinks to herself, well, I really don't want to. I mean, but if I don't do it, I'm going to get in big trouble. I'd probably get whipped. I'd probably be in very, very deep trouble. But the overseer picks up a two pound weight. And many of you know that when you go to the grocery store, you take a weight, like when you buy nails or flour, and you would basically figure out how many pounds and then they would charge you accordingly. This overseer took this two pound weight, hurled it, trying to hit the young kid running away as Minty was standing in a door trying to stop. She gets hit in the head. And basically her scarf is on her head. It rips right into her skull. They drag her off the field. They lay her on a bench for a day or so uh, on a loom, uh, basically, and just let her try to, try to recuperate for a day. Uh, turned out that her scar was wide open. Again, they did not have medical technology the way we have today, so they didn't stitch it up, uh, but she actually had uh, fractured her skull. Uh, 
they had then come out with a term that's called, today it's called temporal lobe epilepsy. And so Harriet, oh, excuse me, at the time Minty, was always seeing visions. She would get premonitions and she would talk about her, her visions from God and how she was able to then hear what was going on. And many people believe that this is one of the reasons why she was never captured as part of the Underground Railroad. This again, this little store is down in uh, Maryland outside of Bucktown. Um, and again, where she initially grew up, there's nothing left there that physically is attached to her except this particular building. There were some names on some of the uh, plantations where they were. As they've done more research, they found that many of the early documentation signs were not in the proper locations. But Kate Larson and others down in Maryland have done a wonderful job of trying to tell the story of that side of it. But hopefully what we'll talk about a little bit are some of the national issues. And as I mentioned earlier, you know, um, Minty's grandmother, uh, Modesty, was taken from Africa into Maryland and her mother, Harriet, Green. Um, so again, she's the second, third generation of enslaved people in her family. Uh, everyone is born free, but they are enslaved by society. And so all of a sudden you have these, uh, these laborers that are there. This invention that came out, mechanical genius, the cotton gin. All of a sudden now you needed a lot of field labor out in the deep south. So in Georgia and South Carolina, uh, Maryland, uh, basically the big crop of the day was growing tobacco and cotton. And so you need a lot of hands to pick the cotton because these machines were much more efficient than people were. So all of a sudden, uh, just to give you an idea, the ownership of the slave went with the women's offspring. So if a, so in Harriet's case, excuse me, Minty's case, Harriet Green was owned and any of her children are also owned by that same master. So um, the Brodus family owned her mother's family. And basically, Mr. Brodus died in 1849. And all of a sudden, the, there was an economic issue. They had to start selling off their slaves as a way. They don't want to sell their land. They would sell their other asset, which are their property as their slave. Uh, turned out that two of Minty's uh, sisters were sold to Georgia, to the Deep South, and never to be heard of again. So again, I think that laid a long, long way into, into Minty's um, reason to, to try to get into this. So um, her two South her sisters basically have never been able to find any information about them. Again, they didn't have a lot of documentation. Um, it's very interesting that uh, Kate Larson actually found the midwife bill for delivering Minty in 1822. So just to give you an idea of the day, uh, the Pennsylvania line, the Mason-Dixon line, is really the free states versus the slave territories. And in this uh, illustration, you can see that the lower south part, where the dark blue are, those are the slave states. The upper part are the red um, and those are the free states. And you can see California, 1848, 49, they joined the free society. The rest of these are all territories. And at the time, they're starting to debate, should they become a free state or a slave state? And again, a, a lot of it depended upon the agriculture and exactly why someone was, was growing a crop. They needed more help. So this is the... Uh, the notice that all of a sudden after Harriet's first two sisters had been sold south, Mrs. Brodus is selling off her, her slaves. And so Minty and her two brothers, Ben and Harry, decide to take off. And all of a sudden they're gone for a short time. Um, Mrs. Brodus then puts an ad in the newspaper and fairly accurately describes what they look like, how old they are, what their issues are, if they have any marks. And she puts out a reward, all of a sudden $300 for these escaped slaves. Uh, Kate Larson found this particular document, but in this case, this was her first attempt. Her two brothers decided that they had wives and kids and that they were very much afraid that the Brodus family would take it out on the, the, the wife and the kids 
and whip them unfusely. So they decided to turn back and go back to the farm again, which all three of them did. Um, Harriet, excuse me, Minty at that point, um, goes on. But probably two of the most famous people from the Maryland area that escaped is, of course, Harriet Tubman, but also Frederick Douglass, who was a very close uh, proximity in Maryland to where Harriet was from. And as many of you know, uh, that he landed in Rochester, New York, eventually uh, settled in Washington, DC. I've been to his home down in Washington. So again, um, great orator, tremendous speaker, wonderful uh, spokesperson, and was involved in so many issues besides the Underground Railroad, but uh, in particular women's rights and uh, the, the vote for the African-American. So these two people probably um, have the most notoriety, but Harriet, 1849, she finally does escape and she goes by herself to Philadelphia. And these two people are probably, or these two groups of people are probably the most influential in how Harriet's life turned on. Um, William Still, the person on the right, was the station master. And basically he kept a journal and it was a tremendous project. What he did was as people came in, they would log in their slave name, and then he or they would come up with a new name for them so that it would be very difficult for people to chase them down, kind of like a new identity. Um, and so it was uh, really a tremendous asset. But um, James and Lucretia Mott are two of the people that were part of the uh, Philadelphia Vigilance Society. And again, they are Quakers. They are very much involved in equality. And so many of you that have followed the, the women's rights movement, the Quaker movement, uh, the Quakers believed that men and women were equal, that they should be the same. Uh, they believed in Quaker ministers as being women. And Lucretia Mott was involved with all of that. Uh, they met in uh, down in my old stomping grounds in Poughkeepsie, New York at the Oakwood School there. Um, but they ended up settling in Philadelphia. Uh, the city of brotherly love. And again, one of the largest concentrations of Quakers in the area were in Philadelphia. So tremendous connection between the two of them. Um, the other side of the coin is nationally. You've got uh, on the left-hand side of the screen is the debate. Uh, this Vice President Millard Fillmore is listening to the debate about the fugitive slave law. Um, as many of you probably know, the president dies in office and Millard Fillmore becomes president. Millard Fillmore is from about 10 miles south of here, which is uh, where my grandmother's from originally in Moravia, Summerhill, New York, down in the lower part of Cuga County. And as a young man studied law uh, with the judge here in Cuga County, and then went to Buffalo, uh, got very much involved in Buffalo politics, became mayor there, uh, became um, vice president and then president. So at the time, it was a very difficult decision. Um, and as many of you lately have heard, in Buffalo, the University of Buffalo, he founded the college there. And they have recently taken his name off of one of the buildings because of the connection with the fugitive slave law. And the way I've understood it, um, he kind of looked at it as the lesser of two evils, that the fugitive slave law changed the way that the could capture the slaves. Um, in the old days, when Harriet went from Maryland up to Philadelphia, 130 miles directly, if you look at uh, MapQuest today, uh, probably 150 to 200 miles of walking. Unbelievable. I mean, if I could do that, I, I'm sure many of you would also want to have that opportunity. But um, all of a sudden, when you made it to Philadelphia, you got over the Pennsylvania line, that Mason-Dixon line, you were in free land. You were then free. What the Fugitive Slave Law did was allowed the slave captures to go into other parts of the country, other free states, and grab these people and bring them back to their master. Um, and again, a lot of what happened was People would find someone, they'd grab somebody, maybe they were legitimate, maybe they weren't. Um, and they would take their free papers, as I said in, in, um, in Maryland, half of the population were free blacks, they would take their free papers, rip them up, 
throw them away, and then bring whoever they had back to be sold. And basically, um, the blacks at the time did not have standing to be heard as a witness in a court trial. So one of the people that this happened to it was a story of a young man. Uh, his name was Solomon Northrop, lived in the Baltimore, uh, excuse me, in the Saratoga area, was a tremendous violin player. Uh, he was a carpenter. He was involved in a lot of things. And he was brought down to Baltimore to play at an event, his violin, very, um, very well known. Uh, he, they were then talked to going into Washington, D.C. And at that point, they were, he was then drugged. Uh, some people then took him, sold him down south, brought him down to New Orleans. And I actually, on a trip, went down and found the historic marker, all that's left of the slave auction house in New Orleans. So in 1854, he was sold at auction. They just ripped up all his free papers. They said he was a runaway slave and no one believed him. So 1853, he escapes after 12 years of captivity and he writes his book called 12 Years a Slave. Uh, again, he could read and write, very literate, and it was published by Derby and Miller, a publishing firm in, in Auburn, New York. So the connections with the Underground Railroad abolitionism, and they're all worked out quite well. But you can see it won three Academy Awards. It was a great picture when it first came out. Uh, also, some of his uh, granddaughters, great-granddaughters, live in the Cuga County area as well. So. so let's get back to Harriet. So all of a sudden now with the Fugitive Slave Law, instead of going the 130 miles or 150 miles on foot, or if you can get a wagon ride, or maybe you can stow away on a boat or something, now you have to go to Canada to be free. Otherwise they will chase you down and they will find you. So all of a sudden, as you can see on the map, you can see Poplar Neck, which is where she was born at her father's plantation, where he was enslaved. All of a sudden now, she's got to go 850 to 900 miles to get back to St. Catharines, Ontario, which is where she set up her little shop. She would have her family basically relocate there. She brought her, her brothers, her sisters, her mom and dad, and basically she would take these trips that would go from, from Maryland up to St. Catharines, Ontario, and then uh, try to figure out exactly what they can do. So 1858, a young man by the name of John Brown comes to meet her in Ontario. Um, again, Harriet's house is gone, but the church where she, the family used to congregate is still there. Uh, I was there last year, and it's a really wonderful little, little church that's there. Uh, but John Brown had an idea, and many of you may have heard of his idea or his raid the arsenal at Harper's Ferry down in Virginia, West Virginia today. And most of the uh, military guns and ammunition were all held in, in the munitions at Harper's Ferry. John Brown's idea was let's go in, let's raid the Harper's Ferry arsenal, gather all the guns, all the ammunition, all the powder, and we will start the war. We will start the freedom for the African-Americans. And he wanted Harriet Tubman to participate, to be involved. As I said earlier, Harriet got hit in the head with the, uh, the two pound weight and she got a premonition. She got a thought, said, mm, no, no, don't go. Don't go with, with John Brown. It's a great idea, but you don't want to be anywhere near there. And so she unfortunately claimed that she was ill. She was sick. She couldn't make it. Um, but as Reverend Carter generally says, it's a good thing she didn't go because her story would have ended at that point. You know, again, um, many of us know who go there. There's a tremendous historic uh, national park site at, uh, at Fort Sumter as well. Um, and it didn't go well for John. Uh, he had two sons that were there as well as all the other people. Many of them were killed at the battle. Um, you don't fight a war with the US government because they have plenty of arms and munitions. Um, he was then captured and sentenced for death, and he was then hung as a traitor and a spy. So not good for John Brown. But So again, Harriet, I call it the fugitive stage, okay, where she escapes 1849 to Philadelphia. And William Still 
gets her a job working in a hotel, doing laundry, doing cooking, uh, working, mending clothes, uh, doing bandages, helping people sick. And so she would then go from Philadelphia to Maryland. And Kate Larson, uh, who's probably today the most foremost historian in, in Harriet's life, um, went back and chased each one of the 13 trips that Harriet had made from Maryland up north and trying to figure out exactly who was on each one of these trips. Uh, many of them were her family members as well. And um, basically she uncovered that probably 70 people uh, Harriet rescued. Uh, some of the earlier um, writings talked about 300 members. I think they kind of embellished a little. Um, but the number that is floated around today is 70 slaves directly on the Underground Railroad. And at the time, they had put a $40,000 reward as a capture on her head. So again, $40,000 was a lot of money at that time. So now the connection. So the, the abolitionist movement is all about the Quakers in my mind. Um, and those of you who've studied religion and the women's rights movement know that Lucretia Mott, as I mentioned earlier, she's part of the Philadelphia Vigilance Society and her husband, James. And James, you know, and, and Lucretia in Philadelphia, during the summer, Lucretia comes to Auburn, New York, and she stays with her sister, Martha Coffin Wright. Um, she's married to David Wright, who's an industrialist, owns probably one of the largest uh, agricultural companies in the world at the time. Um, but they were both brought up as Quakers. Um, she was a, a teacher. They both went to the um, Quaker school down in Poughkeepsie. And eventually Martha decided to teach at the school in Aurora, New York, which is in Cuyahoga County. So she settled in this region. So basically, I posed this question to Kate Larson when I first met her. Uh, she was doing her doctoral dissertation on Harry Tubman. And I said this, I believe this is the way that Harry Tubman ended up in Auburn. It was well documented that Lucretia Mott and James were um, met Harriet at, at Philadelphia at the Temperance Society. And it's very well documented that in 1848, the year later, uh, excuse me, the year before, they were both involved in the Seneca Falls Women's Rights Convention. They are two of the five organizers of that Women's Rights Convention. So all of a sudden, um, you know, again, Lucretia came up to Auburn mess many times for the birth of the kids of Martha, as well as for the summers. So I said, I bet, she said, Harriet, you go see my sister, Martha Wright. She will take care of you. And guess what? She did. Um, we found documented uh, notes in Martha's family's journals that they had runaways at their house. Uh, Martha's, let's see, um, oh, let's see. Um, the whole legal society was involved in all of this, but, you know, again, that summer connection was huge. So Harriet comes to Auburn, and at that time in 1859, she decides to uh, look and settle some roots. Um, there's a small farm, Judge Elijah Miller, um, who dies in 1851. Um, he has a small uh, legal business. Uh, his partner, junior partner, is this guy, William Seward, who then married his daughter. Um, so one of the conditions of the marriage was that William Seward lived in the Miller house. And so today we call it the Seward house, but I call it Judge Miller's house. But after Judge died, uh, William Seward basically becomes the executor for his father-in-law. And Francis, um, so there's two, two daughters, and William Seward's wife, Francis, and her sister, Janet, are the, uh, basically they inherit the farm. Uh, this little seven acre farm just on the edge of Auburn in the town of Fleming. And so Harriet decides that we will buy this farm the cost is she decides she has to pay for it. She doesn't want it free in charge. So it's $1,250 is what they agreed to. It's a purchase price for this little seven acre farm. Has apple orchards and cherries and it's where the hogs were and things. Basically it's $25 down and $10 a quarter. 
So I did the math and it's basically a 30 year mortgage. And so Harriet would have to earn money. And again, at the time, um, you just put a couple more zeros after that. Um, and that's what today's numbers would be like. So um, 1859, she moves into that house. She starts taking borders. Uh, she's got to make some money. She has a, a slew of 40 hogs. So she goes up and down the street looking for thrown out old dirty vegetables so that she can then feed them to her pigs. Um, so she's doing whatever she can to raise some money. She meets a young person in this, from the Civil War who comes to the house looking for work, looking for a place to live, and that's Charles Nelson Davis. And 1969, they decide to get married. But as it's often said, uh, Harriet, you know, was uh, today you'd call her a cougar because she was 22 years older than Nelson Davis. Uh, again, a young uh, soldier in the um, Civil War, and Davis worked in the in the brickyard in Fleming. So basically, making bricks, becoming a mason. So he was very much involved in that. Has a big influence in Harriet's life. Uh, 1880, that little wood frame house on the seven acre farm burns uh, as they're basically doing the laundry in the basement one day. And so what do they do? They reuse the foundation and they build a new brick house out of bricks that Nelson Davis and his brothers and her brothers make um, right there in that area. So 1883, they have a new house and they've got a lot of expenses. So how's Harriet gonna pay her $10 a quarter? Well, Sarah Bradford's, who's um, her brother taught at the Auburn Theological Seminary, decides to interview Harriet Tubman and do a, a book. So it's basically becomes the first written autobiography of Harriet, or biography, I should say, of Harriet Tubman's life. And here, Harriet tells stories. Um, and so 1886, they start to then raise some money to help pay off some of these debts uh, to create this home for the agent. As I said, Harriet brought people in to live in her house here in Fleming but her dream was to create a bigger house. And there was also a um, home for the aged for the widows and orphans of the Civil War in Auburn. Uh, but those were th for the white family. Um, Harriet's dream was to create a home for the aged for all families so that everyone would be able to have a place to live. So another one of Harriet's missions in life was involved with the Amy Zion Church. So in 1891, she helps raise money to lay the new cornerstone. Um, she commits to raising $500 towards this new church. So it shows how enthusiastic she was about this particular church. This was her, her parish that she was involved with, although she was married in the uh, Presbyterian church. Um, so she was involved in all the churches in town, but after this one happened, she then became very much in Nile with it. So she goes to an auction. And I'll tell you a brief story here, but um, one of the gifts I get, I guess, is uh, certain days when Reverend Paul Carter and his wife are out of town and they do the tours at the Tubman home, I get to be the guest docent. And so I get to tell the story and to hear Reverend Carter talk about it. He is a spectacular speaker and talks about how the 25 acres, there's a farm next door to Harriet's home that goes up for auction just on the border. So part of it's in the city, part of it's in Fleming. And Harriet tells, um, tells the, the story in her book. Uh, basically, she says she felt like a blackberry in a pail of milk. She's the only black person in the room listening to the auction. And so the auctioneer goes, $1,000, $1,100. And then you hear this little voice in the back, $50. 1,200, 1,300, 50, and then 1,400, and then it got very quiet. And at that point in time, Harriet said that she was thinking, she was praying to God, what should I do? This is my dream, this is my vision, this is what I wanna see happen. And what happens? She goes, $50. So she ends up buying this 25 acres for $1,450 stunned the rest of the community. Uh, fortunately, the Osborne family uh, that were very much involved with this agricultural business, um, it then was purchased by um, uh, another uh, J.P. Morgan, 
and it was merged into a company today they call it International Harvester. So it had 4,000 people working at it at one point in Auburn. So you can tell how big this organization was, but the treasurer of it was one of the people that helped create the board of directors for this new home for the aged. So all of a sudden, how do you make it happen? How do you pay the bills? And so Harriet, in 1903, she then deeds the property to the Amy Zion Church to create the home for the aged. Uh, by the time they set up the not-for-profit group and the board of directors and actually renovate the house, it's 1908 by the time that they actually bring in some residents. So, so there's a couple things going on where Harriet has her house full of people, the home for the aged is full of people, and then there's the John Brown Hall, which is also full of people. So Harriet, her dream is starting to come to, to, to fruition. So um, the, let me show you some pictures. So uh, the Combahee River Raid, okay? So during the Civil War, this is probably where Harriet's life had a huge impact. Um, Colonel Montgomery basically had a troop of African-Americans and Harriet Tubman, and this is an image of her, her Civil War era, basically is the commander of this raid. And so as a nurse and a scout and a spy during the Civil War, she learned how to get around the end many lines. She would learn where they were and she would learn how to work around them. So they were able to basically go down, get on their steamboats, drive down, and they freed 750 slaves and no one got hurt. No one was injured in the raid. Um, this is probably one of the monumental raids in the Civil War. And it was one of these things that really, all of a sudden now they started talking about Harriet as the first woman to ever lead um, an army of men. And she then picked up the nickname of General Tubman. So, but Judge Miller, I, I mentioned earlier, here's a picture of his house, uh, as I said uh, earlier. Today we call it the Seward House, so when you come to Auburn and visit, you can go see that place as well. It's probably the finest house museum in the world because they've had six or seven generations live there and they never threw a thing out. So it's 100% original except for the nameplates on the identifiers. Um, Seward, I can talk about him at nauseum. I've done lectures on him. But I think the main thing to think about Seward was he was politically motivated. He married um, Judge Miller, uh, lived in the house as one of the conditions, but becomes a New York State Senator in 1830, becomes governor of New York in 1839 to 42. 1846, the William Freeman trial. Um, after he's governor, he goes back to Auburn. He needs to make more money because at the time, the governor would pay for all the extravagant parties and the dinners and things and the entertainment. Not like today where the government pays for all that. So he needed to go back and make some more money as an attorney. So he ended up taking the William Freeman trial of an African-American who had been accused of massacring a white family. So he basically um, killed four white uh, family members one night down by the lake. And Seward decides to treat and basically take the uh, case at per diem at free. This is part of the uh, Hippocratic Oath where the lawyers actually do kind things for the community. William Freeman could never afford an attorney. Um, and then um, David Wright, Martha Wright's husband, uh, basically who's a law associate of Seward also donates his time. So that's more of the connection between the Quakers and the abolitionists. Um, doesn't win, he sentenced to death. He then is in prison awaiting for his trial, a new trial, because Seward had granted a new trial. Uh, unfortunately, he died while he was in prison, and they did an autopsy, and they found out that his brain was completely deformed. So if you go into the Seward House, and I've done this when we've taken some of the uh, politicos through the, the, the talk, we pull out the Gray's Anatomy book, and there are Seward's notes for this case all inside of that. So I think it's a great, a great story. Um, and again, the first, well, it's one of the early times not the first, but one of the early times it was ever used innocent by reason of insanity right here in Cuca County in our courthouse here. And as you know, he then becomes the United States Senator. He's the odds on favorite for president. When they create this new Republican Party, he's one of the founding members. And this other lowly guy that nobody knows, he's lost every other race except one he'd ever been in. 
um, Abraham Lincoln gets the nomination. Uh, Seward then goes out and actually we told this story to Hillary Clinton too, believe it or not, when she was in Auburn um, at the Seward House. But Seward was the odds on favorite to win the nomination, to win the, the election uh, because he was well known. Uh, but this little known person from Illinois who never won one congressional race, never had a name for themselves, gets the nomination, gets elected president, and then turns around and appoints him secretary of state. Same thing happened to Hillary with Barack Obama, where she was then elected, or, you know, she did not get the nomination, but was appointed secretary of state. So um, Seward was also part of the uh, assassination at Lincoln's Ford Theater, someone else on Howell, Powell tried to, to kill him that night as well at his house. Um, the one who went after the vice president chickened out, uh, went out and got drunk instead. And so they, they tried to basically knock off all the succession. It was a great story, a great steal, but uh, Seward made it and um, survived under the Johnson administration. And probably one of his biggest things was working on the Emancipation Proclamation with Lincoln, as well as the purchase of Alaska. That's probably his biggest claim to fame, so. Anyway, back to Harriet Tubman. So this is an early photograph that we actually found that shows the historic marker that was placed actually in front of the home for the agent. The brick house in the background and the barn at the time were not known to have any connection whatsoever with Harriet Tubman. And that is the Judge Miller farm that was then converted with the replaced brick building on the after the wood frame fire that I mentioned earlier. So again, this is one of the only early photographs that we've been able to find. Um, but this is what the, the brick house looked like after it was built. So it had a distinctive front porch and a distinctive side porch. And then you, now you can see the barn in the background. This is a picture from back in 1947 that was uh, Beth Crawford from Crawford and Stearns been able to uncover. So here's a picture that was actually taken on the grounds. Uh, on the left is Harry Tubman. Next to her seated is Nelson Davis, her husband. And between them is Gertie, who was their adopted daughter. Uh, again, there's been some controversy whether Harriet actually had any biological children. Um, there's a thought that there may have been one person who was born in Baltimore that Harriet then brought back to Auburn during the Civil War, and actually the Seward family took care of her. So if, when you go to the Seward house and you see that exhibit, you can hear a little bit more about that possibility. Again, it hasn't been proven yet. You know, again, Gertie's family has died off, so we have lost track of them. But the others are people that were living at Harriet's place where Harriet would take care of them. Um, they're the blind lady in the front there, um, you know, and again, Pops, um, all of these different people. But the Amy Zion Church that she helped lay the cornerstone of, this is what it looked like in 1905. To the right is the Parsonage Building, which is um, where the minister of the Amy Zion Church would live. So again, this was part of a little complex uh, we were able to find some pictures of it, uh, but one of the big um, concerns are, is the uh, tower has been hit by lightning, not once, but at least twice. So uh, we're trying to figure that out. But here, as I mentioned earlier, that story of the $1,450, uh, this is a picture of when it was initially uh, opened as the home for the agent. So again, this is probably the best picture that we could find of what it actually looked like at the time. Um, but what happens after Harriet dies? Um, she then, basically, she moves into what's called the John Brown Hall. So this was a little infirmary, kind of like a hospital that was also on the grounds, and she named after John Brown. Um, so she called it the John Brown Hall or the John Brown Infirmary. And so this picture was taken about 1912, you can see in the center is uh, a lady with the scarf around her head. That is Harriet. And the people who worked there and other residents who were living in that little uh, hospital at the time. So this building was uh, probably the last known photograph of Harriet Tubman. And we understand and we believe that she died actually in this building on the grounds. Um, but again, 
In the 1930s, what happens is the depression hits and all of a sudden the building is empty. The Amy Zion Church does not continue to keep people up. There's a big uh, controversy that the church cannot raise the money to keep the place going. Under Harriet's time, uh, she would go out and actually raise the money for the food, the vegetables and the crops and she'd raise her pigs and she'd do whatever she could to make some money. And in this case, the church basically started to charge people to live there, kind of like a fee. And Harriet was dead as set against that. So there was a big falling, falling out. She didn't want to see anybody charged because she wanted young people to be able to be there, you know, people that couldn't afford it. So, so all of a sudden now it's, it's a vacant property. The city condemns it. Um, although this building is technically in the town, uh, it, I guess they didn't really know where the line went. It was just kind of the other side of it. But uh, so in 1940s, the city actually pushes it in. So all of a sudden, you now you have a foundation with a brick rubble inside of it. Um, now, after Harriet dies, March the 10th, 1913, there's a big funeral in Auburn, New York. People come from all around the world um, to lay Harriet to rest. And again, at the Amy Zion Church, this is a uh, gravestone which uses her full name, which is Harriet Tubman Davis. Again, her, her second husband was Nelson Davis, so she uses that as the name at that point in time. But you can see um, 18, or excuse me, 1914, there's an article in the paper that talks about Harriet's house. And uh, Beth Crawford was able to find this picture. Um, you can see it's disheveled, it's not taken care of but this is the house where Harriet lived. Um, unfortunately, later on in the research, we were able to determine that the property went to a couple of her relatives who then could not really afford to keep the house up, could not afford to pay the taxes, and then sold the house to a white family. Um, basically, the Norris family decided to buy it, and 1914, they live in the house. Great little seven acre farm, and what happens? Um, as in most houses today, they decide, well, we're gonna change the front porch. So they change the front porch and they're gonna change the windows and they're gonna take off the shutters and they're gonna take off the side porch and they're gonna put a bigger porch on. And then they take the, the, uh, the barn out and back and they convert it into their business. Um, so they're into trucks and buses. They're, so they have a trucking company. And so they build these additions on the side of the barn. And you can see on the back of the picture on the left that there's a little lean-to. And so that's kind of like a little summer storage place, a little kitchenette. Um, so again, this is probably the best picture that they've been able to find so far of Harriet's house. But at the time, um, no one understood that this was connected to Harriet Tubman. So, so here, is the home for the agent. So you saw that picture uh, that I showed you of Harriet with the brick house in the background. Well, this is turning at 90 degrees and looking directly to the east. And here's the front of the home for the agent. Uh, basically, we believe that these were taken about 1947. And again, people were taking the house apart for firewood. Uh, during the depression, people couldn't really do much. Um, I apologize, but these are actually two different pictures that I tried to merge together to give you an idea of what the house looked like, but you can see it was in horrible shape. So in 1947, a young architect by the name of Wally Beardsley was tasked with trying to do some documentation of what's there. And I call it kind of a precursor to preservation architecture, where he actually took his sketch pad and his drawings and he went out and he sketched exactly what was where, where the wood was still left on the walls, where it was missing, where the studs were for the foundation and the partitions. Again, there was no basement under this building. So he was then the young architect that then took the building and the Amy Zion Church decided to make a memorial to Harriet Tubman. Again, she was a leader in the Underground Railroad, um, her namesake, and basically the church had acquired the property and it was falling apart. Uh, the bishop at the time decided to take a leadership role, go out and raise lots of money, 
and they go out. Um, actually, Wally Beersley, before he retired, gave me um, copies of all of the drawings uh, that he had taken, as well as the estimate of what he thought it would cost to rebuild the building. So 1953, they opened the building and it becomes the Harriet Tubman Home for the Aged. Uh, this is a more uh, traditional picture of later on, but you can see they put the porch back on, they put the columns in front, um, and again, they put the siding back on. Uh, they went to a cedar shake roof. Um, so again, I think it was probably a good attempt at trying to renovate the building as a memorial to Harriet. Uh, the church's family had donated uh, property. Um, again, all the furnishings were missing and gone. And so they then took, um, let's see, Harriet's sister's family, her brother, uh, John or William Stewart, um, the new name he got after going through um, Dr. or through William Still in Philadelphia was Stewart. They're basically a bedroom set that Harriet lived in or stayed at their house in Auburn uh, was donated. And that's part of the exhibit here at the Home for the Aged. So the upstairs, the second floor was renovated as the resident manager's apartment. So he and his family would live on site. And so in 1953, they started opening it up for an annual pilgrimage. The Amy Zion Church uses this as the major fundraiser for the year to try to offset the cost of running the facility. So again, they have a resident manager, um, Reverend Carter and his wife, and basically um, taking care of the property, paying the insurance, the gas and electric bills. So that's one of the reasons that, that they, they started the tours was to basically do that. So, um, so 1947 to 53, and then they do the pilgrimage. Um, 1974, a young man by the name of Vincent Forrest, who was uh, probably a civil rights guy from the 70s, they talk about thematic designs of African Americans. And so being a young architect, he proposes Harriet Tubman, let's take her property and put this into a thematic design. Uh, basically, they're trying to document places around the country that are connected to famous African Americans. And because of the Sarah Bradford book, Harriet's name was out there, uh, probably more so than others. Um, and that's one of the reasons why Harriet's name is synonymous with the Underground Railroad because of the early publications. Uh, many of the early children's books talk about Harriet and her 13 trips to free the slaves. But at the time, they only document and talk about the home for the aged. Again, it was renovated, you know, 21, 22 years earlier. And so it was in relatively good shape. And Vince is instrumental in this whole project. Again, he's number one in terms of putting the pieces together. He started the thematic design, got the documentation, which made a, a big impact. But later on, we found out in 1990, the Norris family decides to sell off the, the brick house. Um, they don't no longer need it. Um, probably 25 years earlier, they had carved out a quarter acre and put a little house for mom on the corner. And so they built a modern house in the 1960s that their mother moved into. And so at that point, mother Norris, grandmother Norris, then moved into the little brick house. And then they tried to sell off the, the remaining balance of the seven and a half or seven acres. And basically the Harriet Tubman Home Incorporated buys it to save it, to rescue it. And as we started doing research, I asked Mrs. Norris, why, why would you disavow any connection with Harriet Tubman? Again, William Seward, who at the time was the United States Senator, signs a deed to a property to a fugitive slave. I mean, that was probably reason for treason at the time. I don't know why Seward did it, but he did. But um, she said that they were afraid that if Harriet Tubman's name was known, that she owned this brick house, that people would come and actually steal bricks out of the house as souvenirs because of how important Harriet Tubman was. So they disavowed any connection with Harriet at the time in 1975, 74, when they were doing the thematic design. Um, and unfortunately, they just had one page on the nomination that Harriet Tubman is great. She's one of the leaders in the Underground Railroad and her house should be documented and, and designated as a National Historic Landmark, which is one of the highest levels. It's, it's higher than on the National Register of Historic Places, as many of you probably know. Um, so 
our first grant. Um, again, I was trying to find money. And so the Preservation League had this uh, basically a small grant. So we got $4,375, the first grant, which was to basically do the research on the Home for the Aged to find out the real history behind it, uh, try to document what we could of it. But more importantly, to do the brick house where Harriet lived with her second husband, Nelson Davis, to also include the uh, Fort Hill Cemetery and the Thompson Memorial Amy Zion Church on Parker Street. So uh, this small grant basically did the historic research for it. Um, we were able to, with the help of Wint Aldrich, uh, who was one of the deputy commissioners of preservation, got to be a great friends with Wint, wonderful man. Um, he brought people from the National Register, people from Philadelphia to Auburn, and we showed them a couple things. As many of you that know me, like I like to show off. So I brought them to the Harry Tubman home and the grave site, and basically they loved it. Um, and then I brought them to the Willow Chapel, one of the only complete Tiffany interiors in existence in the world that's here, one of the few. And so all of a sudden, you know, she said, yes, National Register nomination for both landmark status for both go so we did um but probably the biggest key was to create a not-for-profit organization when we were first trying to find money uh the state uh tanya rubitsky who was with the preservation league basically said well if you had a, a not-for-profit we could fund it uh, the first grant went through the city uh, but as a um, religious organization, the separation of church and state is frowned upon. So uh, Reverend Carter and created the Home for the Aged, uh, became a not-for-profit group, got the 501c3. Uh, local attorney, Mark Fandrick, who then became a judge, uh, did the not-for-profit organization work for us and all of the exemptions and things. And all of a sudden it becomes the development arm of the Amy Zion Church. Again, the church, probably appoints most of the members of the board, uh, but it becomes the, the way to do this. So again, early on, we had Syracuse University, uh, Doug Armstrong looked at the John Brown Hall and tried to document the site itself, um, found some of the brick, we found it in the backwoods and tried to uncover some of that. But another key to this whole thing was becoming part of the Save America's Treasures Millennium Council program that the White House does. So um, as I, as you know, I, I love history. So I nominated these sites. So we became a designated community. The Harry Tubman home was designated. The William Seward house was designated. The William or the Willard Memorial Chapel was included as well as the Case Research Lab where Ted Case did the initial sound on film invention with Bob, well, let's see, with William Case. It's, today it's called 20th Century Fox. So anyway, and then uh, the Shines Theater is all. So they're all Save America's Treasure sites. And so our connection really was through the Preservation League. And they were trying to find people to go uh, to follow um, Hillary Clinton as First Lady from Washington to Seneca Falls to be the keynote speaker for the 150th anniversary. And they called me up and said, hey, is there anything worth seeing in Auburn? And of course, we had to show them everything. So we did get uh, two things in. I was told I could invite 35 people to meet the first lady. And as you can see from the picture, um, I invited a few more than that. Uh, it took me about uh, two weeks to open it up and we ended up making tickets. And I was supposed to, at the time, it was before the 9-11 fiasco. And so security was more laxed. I was supposed to or required to get social security numbers for everybody who had a ticket. And so, I can tell you a long story about how we were able to do that, but I ended up printing 4,000 tickets. We had probably 2,500 people, 3,000 people on the grounds, um, but we brought all the politicians in town and it was really a tremendous thing. So here is Hillary announcing a $7 million gift for the flag for the restoration that flew over Fort McHenry that's at the Smithsonian. She comes to Auburn, Save America's Treasures, um, and they're part of the tour. Basically, she announces a $10,000 gift for the Harry Tubman home from the Bitsy Folger Foundation. And when I first got to meet her, I felt like saying, well, that's just an initial down payment on a long-term relationship. And hopefully over time, we'll be able to build this into a much bigger project. 
And that's exactly what happened. Again, I probably met Hillary about 30 times, especially after she became U.S. Senator. And her chiefest, or one of her staff members from New York was also from Auburn. So we had some built-in connections. And so loved coming back to Auburn. But, but because this was one of the few sites that had people in it, the White House Millennial Council had um, USA Today, Vogue Magazine, Times Magazine, New York, uh, Newsweek Magazine, all of them carried feature articles about Auburn and the people in the pictures, the Seward House. So we actually had two stops on, on the Save America's Treasures tour. So that was huge, I thought. Um, Reverend Carter and I got invited down to Ederson Cottage, which is that has then relaying the Lincoln Cottage, which is the site of the writing of the Emancipation Proclamation, which as many of you know, in 1863, was announced that as of January 1st, all of the enslaved African-American were now going to be free of the enslaved states. Um, basically, it was a political thing. Uh, Seward was involved with it, but th at the same day, this is a, a couple of months later, uh, we got $40,000 from Save America's Treasures for architectural research, but then $450,000 announced this day with President Clinton. And so afterwards, uh, we were in the second row. So I was able to go up and talk to the president for a few minutes and bend his ear about Hillary and her time in Auburn. And as you can see, Bob Stanton is the director of the National Park Service is on the left. Uh, you've got George Frampton, who's uh, involved with the White House. and Togo West, who's the Secretary of Veterans Affairs, is in the center. Um, so again, this is on the, the veterans site in Washington. It becomes the summer cottage. Really a great time to be in Washington. But this is Reverend Carter on the left and, and uh, Bob Stanton. And so as I mentioned, they were allowed us to, to go up in the front and to reserve seating. Uh, talking with Secretary Stanton, he told the stories that basically he was a young African-American who was hired as an affirmative action program when he was in high school as working in the parks. And he decided to make a go of it. And he kept working and going back and he got hired as a permanent employee and then he worked his way up the chain and he became the director of the National Park. A tremendous opportunity. He actually uh, did that job for quite some time and then he retired. Uh, Bill Clinton actually enticed him to come back out of retirement to take over again as the National Park um, Secretary. And we are fortunate in terms of timing, you know, again, trying to put things in place, being in the right place at the right time. But as I mentioned, Reverend Carter was instrumental in creating the Home for the Aged and doing all of the successful um, projects that we had done. Um, you know, again, uh, we then started talking about the politics of this. And so this is where I got much more involved. And so Vince DeForest, you heard me mention his name earlier with the National Register discussion back in 1974 or five. Vince comes to Auburn and does a tour through the Harry Tubman home, straw hat, great guy. And he says, no, we got to do something. He was involved with the... Um, Frederick Douglass site in Washington, DC, and also with the Martin Luther King site in Atlanta, where the Park Service had taken a relationship where the uh, National Park Service helped assist uh, a not-for-profit group to own and operate and maintain a property. So Bishop Walker, who you can see in the, the right-hand corner here up above, uh, Bob Stanton, Vince DeForest, the Bishop, and myself, we all meet in Washington, DC at, at Mr. Stanton's office. And Bob Stanton says, well, Reverend uh, Bishop, there's two ways to do this. One is the easy way, where we just have the president sign an executive order and you transfer the property over to the National Park Service. Or two, uh, you continue to own it. You end up with a management plan. You do a study of some sort. You figure out if there's a federal interest or not. And then it has to go through the appropriations process and basically having the money appropriated and then it becomes part of the budget and part of the connection with the Park Service. And the Bishop said, we are never, never, ever going to get away with any of Harriet's property. So we are going to basically transfer the property. No, never, never going to happen. So we will do option number two. We'll do the study. 
Um, Emil Houghton, who was a Republican from down in the Corning area, tremendous guy, uh, president, CEO of Corning Glass, uh, at the time was the richest member of Congress. Um, so he did the right thing. He was into it for politics. No, he was involved in doing the right thing. So um, actually on the way up to visit with Mr. Stanton in his office at the Department of Interior, um, I'm in the lobby and there's this guy waiting for the elevator. It happens to be Congressman Hone. And he looks at me and he shakes his, he kind of stares a little. He says, do I know you? And I said, well, Congressman, yes, my name's Mike Long. I've met you, you know, once or twice before, and I'm here to talk about Harry Tubman and a national park. And so I'm gonna meet with Mr. Stanton. He said, let me know about it, I'm all in. And so he becomes the first um, trying to write the legislation for actually creating the Harriet Tubman Special Resources Study Act. Unfortunately, it's de defeated. You know, he calls me up one night and says, Mike, we're on C-SPAN, turn on your TV. So went down in flames. Uh, the next critical piece in this whole thing, again, political networking is a big thing that they never teach you in school, but you have to learn it in your own professional life. And so um, this young congressman who had been elected to be the U.S. Senator, Chuck Schumer, comes upstate, has a plan. He's going to visit all 62 counties. And so he comes to Auburn one day, and we came up with an idea of getting a big bus. We'll put all the politicians on the bus, and we'll drive Chuck around to different things. So we want to see, we want him to, to know about that are, are important to us in terms of our community. So Chuck sits in one front seat and I sit on the other side and I tell him all the stories about things that we need to see. So our first stop, Harry Tubman home. And basically tell him that Amo Houghton in the Congress had talked about uh, the study, the special um, bill was defeated. Amo, and Chuck says, I'm on it. Let me bring Marilyn involved. Let me get Marilyn involved because that's where she's from. Initially, I wanted to do an international study, which included St. Catharines, Ontario, but of course the National Park Service said, that's too big, it'll take too long to do. Fortunately, we only did it with the United States. So Schumer gets involved, Marilyn gets very excited about it and their leadership really goes not, it's, it's the number one project that they're working on. So all of a sudden it's adapted in the, in the Senate Amo brings it back through Congress. It gets uh, signed by President Clinton. So the Special Study Resources Act is basically authorizing the National Park Service to do a study to see if there's some connections, something that's of national significance um, to these particular properties. And the one thing that was involved with the study was the William Seward House because of the ownership issue. Uh, unfortunately, as they were progressing through the study that only took eight years, the executive director at the Seward House did not want to have the National Park Service involved with their property, um, unfortunately, um, so they were withdrawn from the study. Uh, today, the new director basically would have loved that idea because of the connection, but uh, it's water under the dam at this point. So. But as we created the Home for the Aged as the not-for-profit group, I would then author these different grants and we'd work with our politicians. And the, the main thing that I wanna get across to the, those viewing the, the study today, it was bipartisan. We had Republican Senator Mike Mazzolio. I saw him one day and said, Mike, I need money to do studies on the architecture of the brick house. And I said, I just got a $40,000 Save America's Treasures grant. Can I count on you to match it? And he got $50,000 in the budget. I'm sitting on the steps at City Hall and Mike brings Lieutenant Governor um, nominee, uh, Mary Donahue, who's running with George Pataki to City Hall. And he, she's on the steps. And I said, hey, I got this wonderful project we got to tell you about, Miss Harriet Tubman. She gets elected with Pataki to be governor. I got another 50 grand from them. Bitsy Folger from Hillary Clinton, 40,000 as I mentioned, and then the uh, Save America's Treasures. So we got more money from them. And then George Pataki, 248,132 for the um, Thompson Memorial Amy Zion Church. We start the project with a new roof and get rid of the asbestos siding. And then they only gave us $100,000 to start working on the brick house. So at this point, it's really blowing up. It's going great guns. And the Amy Zion Church decides, um, 
I can see their, their rationale there, but it's too big for Reverend Carter to be the resident manager, to be the pastor at the Amy Zion Church there in Auburn as well. And fortunately, the way we worked it out was I would author the grants. I'd say, Rev, sign here. We need a resolution. Let's do this. And he was great guns. Let's go. So with that teamwork, we were able to, to put probably over now probably $1.5 to $2 million of grant money back into that property. So we then, um, after Senator Nazolio got us some money, we did an RFQ and hired Crawford and Stearns as architects and preservation planners. They started the historic structures report on the brick house. They worked on the Thompson Memorial Church, um, started with the roof changes, started with the barn reconstruction project, and then did the brick exterior restoration project that was funded by, by the Amy Zion Church. So they put another million dollars in that building already. But this is a project that really got started, uh, and Beth Crawford is really the, the, the spokesperson for Crawford and Stearns. She found this photograph, which is from Quills Hill across the street, and as you can see, this is the brick home for the eight, where Harriet lived in the center, the home for the ages over to the left. Um, and you can see there were power lines that NYSEG put through back in the early 1930s. Uh, the apple orchard, where the trees were, where the seven acre farm was. And so she started doing research. Um, you can see the barn on the left is where the added bays were put onto this building with concrete block. And I looked at that thing and I said, there's a barn inside of there. And you can see, we took the sides off and then enclosed it, re rebuilt it back to the barn itself to look more like what it did during Harriet's time. But probably one of the biggest changes were taking that initial illustration uh, that was found in, um, in uh, Beth's research. Uh, she found this 1914 illustration that was in a newspaper article and decided to put the porches back on again. Look at the windows, try to figure that out, put a new roof on it. And so this is the building um, as they got through the limited amount of money that they could raise at the time. So they got the front porch back on, they got the windows in, they got a new roof on, they got it enclosed. Uh, they did not um, get, they did do some of the demolition on the inside and was able to uncover as part of the first phase where the original staircase was where the original kitchen was. And so the Norris family over that, you know, 80 years had done a lot of interior renovations. So, uh, but Kate Larson, um, as I mentioned earlier, probably the foremost historian on Harriet. 2004, she comes out with her, she, her doctoral dissertation. She, she then turned into a publication and she wrote her as a book, uh, Bound for the Promised Land. And so she probably has done the most research on Harriet Again, many other people have come out with books in the last you know, 10 years, 20 years, but Kate is probably the, the most known. She's a, a great friend and a wonderful person. I was introduced to her by, by one of uh, Harriet's great grandnieces, um, who's also a close personal friend. But. So we get into the bills. The Special Resources Study Act is authorized. Uh, Schumer and, and Amo Houghton are the big carriers of that. But we then get into the concept of printing the studies. We've got to get into the committees. Um, my boss, B.J. Mittal, uh, was able to go to Washington and, and actually give testimony at one of these hearings. Um, so again, you get into the political side of things, but this uh, Senate Bill number 247 actually creates the Harry Tubman Historical Park in Auburn, but also the Harry Tubman Underground National Historical Park in Maryland as well. So we now have two, two sites that are connected to Harriet Tubman. I believe it may be the first African-American woman national park in the country, but certainly one of the earliest, if not the first. And all of a sudden now, politically, you know, we, we go from different administrations. As I said earlier, um, you know, during the uh, Clinton administration, the money's flowing freely. Um, Reverend Carter and I were invited down to the White House for the uh, final meeting of the um, Millennium Council in the East Room and, and all the other things. And then we have a, a new Republican person and they start slowing down the national parks and they don't create any new ones. And then Obama comes in and then they decided to take the project in Auburn because Harriet was involved with the um, Civil War, that her husband was a, basically a, a 
Civil War uh, hero. Well, I shouldn't say hero, but was a soldier in the Civil War, but she was a Civil War hero. They then tucked this authorization into a national defense authorization bill. So then the Congress won't turn it down. Uh, it's to refund the government for fighting in the government in terms of all the army, the Navy, the Marines. So all of a sudden that bill is one of these riders. So President Obama signs it into law and all of a sudden now the National Park Service can help out. So we're now starting to see the fruits of some of that. Uh, this is Kim, who was the first ranger who was assigned to this area. And during the summer months, they were able to come and spend some time doing some of the tours. This is the side porch on Harriet's home. So Chuck Schumer, as I mentioned, was big, big in the politics of getting the, the thing funded, um, getting it through the appropriations bill, and sitting now as the minority leader of the Senate, has a, a big gravel to speak with. Um, Karen Hill is the person who's uh, in the center here. I apologize. Uh, this is actually a picture I found on Chuck Schumer's website about the, an event that he had. Again, when you're the United States Senator and you tell everybody that uh, tomorrow afternoon at three o'clock, I'm going to be in town to talk about the need to give money to the Harry Tubman National Park, all of a sudden there's 50, 60 politicians show up. There are all these people that just love to be there. Um, none of them had anything to do with the project per se, um, but I was invited to sit in the back and, and see what happened. So again, most of us as public servants know that our job is to make the politicians look good. And if we keep making the politician look good, that's great. I guess my problem is always that um, uh, politics is very difficult to, to work around and especially when you get to this level. So, but Frank, uh, Barrows, who was the superintendent at uh, Fort Stanwyck in uh, Utica, Rome area, uh, basically he was added on to the Harry Tubman home. So he was the one who was actually able to get us some help. Uh, Reverend Carter, tremendous asset. He does the one man band, runs the place, uh, does all the, um, up until the park service was involved, did all the landscaping, all the snow removal, all the cutting the grass. He would hire people. He would take care of cleaning the bathrooms and doing all the tours too, taking the money, selling the gifts. Um, so he and his wife, basically, it was a labor of love, not because they made very much money at all. Actually, they both turned down lucrative jobs in Washington, D.C. doing things, but this was an, uh, a, a mission for him, and he's been there 30 years now. Um, again, we would be nowhere without Reverend Carter. So this is the event we were all looking forward to. As I mentioned earlier, Chuck Schumer was instrumental in trying to find a date that we could get the Secretary of the Interior there. Um, Mike, the guy on the right, was an interim uh, superintendent of the National Park Service. And of course, I don't know if I should say this or not, but the current president was complaining to him that the pictures of the mall did not show as many people on the mall as when Obama was in, in Beckman. Um, his tenure was very short with only three weeks before he was reassigned to another location. But again, most of the people here are from the Amy Zion Church. The bishops are involved. And again, owning the property is going to be the hallmark of the Amy Zion Church. This is Harriet's church. And so they are claiming her, they will keep the ownership forever, but that just starts the process. We now have a designation that we are connected as part of the National Park Service. So to me, this was probably one of my um, fulfilling uh, events that happened in my career was to actually be invited down to Washington to witness this event. Uh, Karen Hill, who's the executive director, excuse me, the president and CEO, I get the title wrong, um, of the Harry Tubman Home Inc. But after it started growing momentum, they decided that they should hire other staff in addition to Reverend Carter and just let him focus on the, on the tours. Um, as we now get the management agreement under design, we can then get into other issues. But So trying to figure out the management agreement has been five years in the process. Um, the Thompson Memorial Church. So we were then told that we had a new bet, uh, new wrinkle where we now had to technically own property. The Park Service had to technically own stuff. Um, so what the church had done was to flip the Thompson Memorial Church and the parsonage over to the National Park Service. 
And so this is part of what I'm trying to talk about, the economic development impacts, where now the National Park Service is actually restoring the, the uh, Thompson Memorial Church. They're finishing the historic structures report. They're working on the, the parsonage. They were actually taking all the asbestos siding off. They're taking the uh, changed um, porch that was done back in the 1970s. And they're actually physically investing money. So that's going on. We also have another uh, piece of money because of the women's rights movement was so instrumental in this area. So you've got the Women's Rights National Park in Auburn. We're married with them as well as Fort Stanwyck over in the Utica Rome area. And so now all of a sudden the governor comes out with a, a new Equal Rights Heritage Center that is basically issued a $10 million grant to the city of Auburn and their whole um, theme was something that, oh, maybe I should mention this, but the day after, uh, shortly after Her uh, Hillary came to Auburn as part of the, the Save America's Treasures Tour, uh, Chuck Mason, who was a city council member at the time, said, we've got to get on this gang and we've got to really work on tourism. Historic tourism is huge. Let's create the Historic and Cultural Sites Commission. And so Chuck proposed it. I was the staff for it did the minutes, the organizational stuff, got every all the members put together, wrote the legislation for it, and had the city council adopt it. Chuck was able to actually get them, the council, to put $50,000 in cash from the city into creating this, this board. Takes those, those um, places that I showed you earlier as the Save America's Treasure sites, those five sites, and added the Schweinfurt uh, Art Gallery and the Auburn Public Theater, and over time, it's actually grown into a promotional organization. So created the Historic and Cultural Sites Commission is now involved with the, the Heritage Center. And that becomes the one point contact. So um, the Empire State Development Corporation, we've got a small grant. Uh, Beardsley Design Architects are looking at building a, um, a, an appropriate visitor center. But more importantly, we've got the Olmsted Center and the National Park Service is working with ESF or the Environmental Science and Forestry in Syracuse. Um, they're working on the treatments. And so one of the uh, studio projects was to look at that. They then turned that into the cultural landscape report and John Atwater and George Curry, my former professor at ESF, are working on the, on the landscape report that the National Park Service is very much involved with. So. But the, the big thing that happened was that President Obama had signed the Harry Tubman Underground Railroad National Monument legislation, which basically creates a national monument down in the swamp area of Maryland. So it gives the federal government right to take this property and give it a little bit more uh, pizzazz. Uh, Kate was involved with that. She wrote the history of it. Finally, in 2020, she has completed that report. Uh, and again, it's all available online. It's got a lot more information on Harriet's background, but you can see from the illustration in the, in the document about the thousands of acres of land that's part of this uh, federal, uh, kind of like um, Montezuma Wildlife Refuge is over uh, along the thruway. It's also in Cuga County and towards Rochester. Um, similar type of place, but it's a national monument. So. Uh, as I mentioned, Maryland got very involved. And so tourism was a huge part of their reason to invest. Uh, they were able to put together an application to the federal government, got a huge chunk of money under the uh, highway administration to create a visitor center. Um, and they built a $21 million facility. Uh, again, uh, they already in the first year they were doing 750,000 visitors okay up until the COVID hit uh, they were running programs school groups uh, tourism and there's nothing there to see except the exhibits that are in this building um, you can see you can drive down the road where the monument is but it's it's there's not a monument or something you can look at there's a couple historic markers uh, but it's very, very hard to understand, but uh, you can see the exhibit that talks about Harriet's early life in Maryland. So what I've tried to talk a little bit about today is the, uh, her life later on in Auburn, where she spent over 50 years. So 
my pitch to the lieutenant governor, actually, I was able to, uh, as a docent, able to give her the tour and her husband the tour personally um, as just regular citizens. Nobody knew who they were. Um, I was working them through the project. And again, I said, well, if Maryland can spend $21 million on their property, we actually have Harriet's house. We have Harriet's gravesite. We have the church that Harriet worshiped in. We have all of these physical assets as well as a lot of other neat things to see. The state of New York should put in more than $21 million. I mean, come on, we're the empire state. So we have not gotten there yet. Um, I did ask him for 30 million. Uh, it was put in the plan. Um, the city then took the 10 million out for the visit, the welcome center, which is a great asset and it's a wonderful stepping stone. But hopefully as things continue to grow, um, I shouldn't say this very loudly, but Joe Biden, who's running for, for president right now, his first wife uh, is from Auburn. And um, so, you know, Uncle Joe comes back to Auburn periodically. Uh, one of his very high um, chief of staff when he was in the Senate is from Auburn as well. So we've got a lot of great connections, but you want to exploit those. Here is phase one of the National Park Service. You can see where they stripped the siding off the off the, the house next door and, and they're starting to paint it up. They put a new, new, um, new paint job on it. They're putting a new roof or uh, fix the roof on the church as well. But unfortunately it was struck by lightning again. So they're trying to figure out from a historic structures report, what's the, the next step. So that's one of the things that are going on. Um, we're trying to finish that um, historic structures report also for the brick house. Uh, the, um, Beth Crawford is still working on with Crawford and Stearns has been hired as a consultant back to the park service as well. So, but you notice how I said, Mrs. Norris was afraid that they'd take a brick out of Harriet's house. Well, they did. We took one brick out and the Harry Tubman home put it on display at the African American Museum of Culture uh, in Washington, DC. So if you ever get down to DC, one of the neatest things was actually being invited to go down there as well. Um, the shawl was given to Harriet from Queen Victoria as a gift. And so that is also on, explain, on display at the, the National Museum of African American History and Culture. So again, they've got a, a brochure from one of the pilgrimages. And again, as I said earlier, that was the way that they raised the money for it. Um, how much is an illustration of Harriet Worth? It still pays to go dumpster diving. Uh, a person went to, through a dumpster in New York City, found an old little book with old pictures in it, started looking at it, and this one was scratched on the bottom, said Harriet Tubman. Turned out that there was also another person of interest, the first African-American who was elected to the US Congress is in there as well. And so he showed this book to a couple people, showed it to somebody else, and all of a sudden they sh showed it to Swan Galleries and they put it up for auction. Um, the Harry Tubman Home Inc. was trying to raise enough money to buy this illustration of Harriet, the earliest known picture of Harriet taken in Auburn in about 1868, just after the Civil War. Um, but it was purchased by the Smithsonian African American in Culture uh, Museum and the Library of Congress. They went in joint on it. That book, that little book sold for $161,000. So highest paid price for that type of a, a picture on Harriet's. This is the Equal Rights Heritage Center that really focuses on um, the women's rights movement and the connection with Auburn. And then in March of 2019 was dedicated a statue to Harriet. Um, again, there'd been discussion for many years to create a a Harry Tubman statue. Um, as you go around the country, things are really set up so that you end up with um, um, schools being dominated. Um, I just saw uh, a news feed today where somebody's uh, nominating or naming their school after uh, Harry Tubman. Um, and there was debate probably 10, 15 years ago about naming the high school after Harry Tubman here. Did not did not pass muster with the school board at the time. So they did name the administration building after her. Um, one of the schools is named after Governor William Seward, uh, US Senator Seward. 
I think that they should rename all of the schools after different people. And I'd put Harriet Tubman for the high school. I'd also put Ted Case, who invented sound on film with Bill Fox um, and others. So, and then you have the National Park Service. They're still working on the study that they started. Again, uh, this is the picture that Beth Crawford had found. It's a little clearer here where you can see the brick home for the, that Harriet lived in on the right. And you can see the home for the agent on the left and it's, um, deteriorated state, um, but it shows the landscape of what the site was under. One of the projects that the Olmsted Center and I are working on are trying to find an old, old, old apple tree on the site that we can propagate. We've found a couple, we've propagated it, we have not had any luck as yet, but the Olmsted Center sends someone from Boston and we try to do cuttings and hopefully this fall, we will try once again. Uh, the, the spring ones have not worked well, uh, but the plan is to re-propagate the apple orchard using the Harry Tubman apple tree. And if we can get success at re-propagating the, the orchard there, we'd love, love to have Harry Tubman apple trees sprinkled around the country at all the different schools so that we can then blend that into their, into their opportunity for schools and things terms of learning. Um, more recently, um, I was invited to the world premiere of the Toronto Film Festival where the movie Harriet came out and basically talks about Harriet's life uh, before um, leading with her escape in Philadelphia. Um, and this is a tremendous, tremendous movie. Um, I was able to invite uh, Judy Bryant, who's one of the great grandnieces, to go with us, and so uh, brought her along. So she actually saw her great grandfather portrayed as William Henry Stewart um, in the movie. So it's really neat to see your family on on the on the big screen. So, um, but I also heard a story that a young African American person who tinkers in music, who really is still I don't think they're in college yet, but loves music and in writes things, wrote a piece of music that was put in the movie and also was nominated for an Academy Award for that piece of music. So off setting a great, a great, uh, great start to his career. So, but Leslie Odom Jr., the guy on the left plays William Still in this. Uh, many of you may have seen him in Hamilton. Uh, wonderful other story that although those who love politics and history, great marrying of the two together. But um, as you can see in the upper left is the U.S. Uh, Treasury. Um, the Secretary of the Treasury came to Seneca Falls to announce the winner of the contest of to who to put on the money. And basically, uh, we were invited over to Seneca Falls uh, to the National Park Service site there. And uh, they had announced that Harriet Tubman was selected to be on the money. And so, as you probably know, there's a group of women around the country that are going together and trying to, to uh, promote Harriet on the money. Um, they have stamps that they put on $20 bills. And unfortunately, after uh, President Trump was put into office, as you probably know, if you see his picture in the Oval Office, you've got Andrew Jackson is very prominently displayed, uh, who's currently on the $20 bill. So. As you can understand, it's uh, been stalled. Um, one of the very, very interesting stories was that Karen Hill um, had two of the engravers. Believe it or not, they allowed young women to engrave this, Ill, this likeness of Harriet Tubman. And Karen has been invited down to Washington, D.C. to look at the uh, etches and to see if this portrays the image of Harriet Tubman. And basically, uh, the two young women, first time ever uh, having women involved with engraving money, uh, came to Auburn, and we went out to dinner with them, the Springside Inn, another historic site in Auburn, and uh, heard some tremendous stories about that. But unfortunately, that's all been put on hold. But um, again, um, I can just... Uh, I guess at this point, I'll stop rambling on talking about different things, but I just wanted to, to mention also, uh, today I wanna to thank again, Dan Hart and, and Marsha Keyes. Uh, many of you probably know, Marsha was involved with the National Park Service and the State Parks Office for many years, uh, working on the um, 
Erie Canal and uh, going through the legislative process and understands the, the, the time it takes to go through this thing. It's certainly not anything that you want to do overnight, but as two volunteers for the uh, Capital District section, we want to thank them for their endless energy in terms of putting this, this thing together as well as the rest of the members of the committee, uh, Rocky Ferraro and everyone else who's involved. Um, it takes a lot of time. Um, I know I've done it 2000, 2006, we had the conference in Auburn. And so we had a, a large committee that helped as well. And I understand how much effort goes into it, but it's well worth it. Uh, hopefully you make some friends as part of it. Uh, but secondly, I also wanna thank Bean. Uh, planners and design and planning and design uh, for their sponsorship for tonight's um, talk. Basically, I first met John back in 2000, let's see, no, 1990 or so, when we did our comprehensive plan. He was working for another agency and he was assigned as the member to help us write our comprehensive plan. So part of this whole story was melded into this comprehensive plan that, that John and others had helped us with the city of Auburn. So again, we focused on downtown revitalization, but more importantly, looking at historic preservation and historic tourism as one of the major themes. So, um, so at that point, I guess what I'll do is I will stop in my diatribe that's been going on for many, many moments here and see if there's questions. I know Marsha has been trying to figure out if there are questions, so we, we do have a question for you, Mike, but before I do that, I would just like to add that you could tell that I was not exaggerating when I said early on when I introduced Mike that he's truly one very persistent planner and he has devoted much of his life to this cause. And that becomes very obvious when you listen to this uh, process that he has explained. And speaking of process, the question is, um, Back when you were talking about the easy way and the hard way to create a national park, um, we have a question from a person saying, could you elaborate on that a little bit more? Um, I think that you uh, uh, talked a little bit about the hard way. Maybe you want to explain the easy way, which... Uh... Yeah, well, uh, basically the easy way is transferring ownership. Um, and so if you own property, you have a deed, first you have to decide it's historic that it's something that meets the criteria for the National Park Service in terms of elevating it to that level. Um, yeah, I know Marsha understands this and, and I'm starting to a little bit, but you start with the National Register of Historic Places. So that's kind of the, the, the first step. And then you go to the National Historic Landmark and then you go to a National Historic Site. And so as you go up the ladder, you go towards what's important to the history at the time. And so we were able to, to move this up to national landmark status. Um, so that was one of the reasons why we, we got into that. Um, but when we first broached the subject with um, Director Stanton, you know, he said, well, the easy way is you just transfer the property to the, the National Park Service. We decide it's worthy of telling a specific story. And as, as many of you know, and, and Marsha specific, um, that story changes. You know, so that, you know, the story 30 years ago, well, let's say the story in 1974 was that Harriet was a neat person. Okay. All right. So what? Um, today, the Underground Railroad has gotten a lot more study. People think of it as more important. So all of a sudden it elevates. And the history that's talked about, you know, 100 years ago or 200 years ago, um, unfortunately, is probably by an older white man who writes their bias into it. And I do that myself, um, unfortunately, um, as part of history, is trying to rewrite it so that it, ha it captures the, the, the movement of today. So, so, you know, Bob Stanton basically said, transfer the property to us. The next step is that the Park Service looks at it and says, yes, this is something of, of international or national significance. And they, they do an internal work on it. They do a project. Um, Again, you know, we worked out of the Boston office for some of the early projects, but they develop a team and they look at it. Um, they do a report. Again, they're authorized for usually two years to do the report and it usually takes four to six years. Um, you know, again, because you, you get a great story and you uncover more information. So, and then, then you talk the president in if the president is sympathetic, the politics involved, you know, so all of a sudden now, 
at the time when Bill Clinton was involved, Bob Stanton could have said, hey, President, um, sign here. We'd take it on. And basically, they made the offer. So that's the easy way. Just have the president sign an executive order like Obama did with the monument. You know, basically, he signed, signed the Harry Tubman Monument down in, in Maryland because the politicians in Maryland pushed it. And again, you need to build consensus. You need to build political support. And you've got to hopefully work on both sides of the aisle, which is one of the things that we did here in, in Auburn. Uh, John Kako, who's our Republican congressman, has been one of the leaders in terms of presenting the story of Harry Tubman. Um, he actually helped kick things started um, before things got going, you know, trying to kick the church into making a decision. Are we going to do this or are we not? And finally get them to say, yes, we're going to own it. We're going to continue it and, you know, try to, to make that story told. So I don't know if I indirectly or directly answered your question, but executive order is the easy way out. If you can get the president and the political support, that's always the best. That's great. Well, people do not always realize that sometimes uh, our history is very much wrapped up in our current political processes and how we interpret our history is very much a, a sign of the times that you're in. Um, I do have another question here from a, a po folks. Um, can you share information on the economic impact to Auburn from the Harriet Tubman site and or from historic tourism in general? And do you have any particular resources you might point to for that? Yes, um, that was the whole reason that we got into the Historic and Cultural Sites Commission that I mentioned um, 1998, that we actually started to get the, the five local sites to talk together, to coordinate their efforts so that we could then have a uniform calendar and things like that. Um, we probably, one of the first things that we did was that we published a walking guide, um, kind of like a, a road map that showed where the sites were, where the historic district was, and things like that. And I was doing a construction project out in front of City Hall. And there's a car driving down the street and it's all gravel and, you know, we're, we're reconstructing the whole street. And because I was going out to get the money to do it, we were using federal money. So we got 80% feds, 15% state and 5% local. And I was able to put the historic lights back and do all the, the touches. Um, there's a car sitting there at the red light and I look at it and there's our map, but it's all folded up, but it's in black and white. And I'm scratching my head saying, well, where's that? And this car has Connecticut license plates and it drives off. Basically, these were people who, were, who had gone online, found our website and downloaded our map, even though we had sent it to the printer and we were doing that kind of stuff. But the economic impact of uh, historic sites is, is tremendous. And so as we then got into this with the National Park Service, that's one of the themes that they look at is how big can they build the site? How many visitors are you going to get? And so we did some studies and um, one of the, the guys that was very much involved with the, the Philadelphia project um, who came up was our, our contact for a lot of this stuff. He basically says, you know, the semantics and the logistics of your site because of your other proximity to the women's rights convention site over in Seneca Falls, the Fort Stanwix, uh, Syracuse, uh, Ithaca, and Rochester, you know, with uh, the Eastman House and all the other things that are in that corridor. The economics is very much like uh, the Hudson Valley. And if you look at it where I grew up, uh, the Roosevelt Mansion is there. The, the High Park is there where uh, Franklin Roosevelt lived. You've got the Vanderbilt Mansion and you've got Valkyll, which is um, where um, Mrs. Uh, Franklin Roosevelt lived. And she had her own shop. She had her own uh, cottage back there, Valkyll. And my mother took me there. You know, again, probably my mother instilled a lot of women's rights issues in me as a young kid. You know, I had to do dishes. I had to do this. I had, you know, I, I couldn't just be waiting around for someone to take care of me. So I thank my mother for that. It probably got me into the women's rights movement as much, but she brought me to Valkyll. And actually, as I, as I think about it, she also was a volunteer docent at the Vanderbilt mansion, working in the gardens, taking care of the flowers. But they used the visitation numbers of those sites that we probably 
to between two and a half and three and a half million visitors per year in Auburn. And if you look at the economic impact that that has in an economic sense, it's tremendous. How many hotels do you have? How many places do you have for gas? Who can go out for dinner? Um, where do you buy souvenirs? You know, things of that nature. And the spinoff business is uh, a big part of what the tourism office does here in Auburn is to look at the economic impact and the Department of, um, of uh, oh, ESDC now, the acronyms. Uh, basically, they look at all the studies. But the amount, um, one, one time uh, Frank Barrows, who came and did a talk here in Auburn about history when we were first getting started, talked about, you know, people talk about sports. And they talk about the, the impact of these sports teams and things like that. So you go to National Football League, you take all their games. You go to the uh, American and National Baseball, you take all of their teams, all their, you take all the soccer games, you take all their stadiums and all of that. That is just a fraction of what the impact of the National Park Service has on the bus you know, businesses and the benefits of the communities that they're there. You know? And again, with only 414 national parks, there's not a lot of them. I mean, so the impact is just tremendous. Um, it's very hard to get a grasp uh, a specific number, so to speak. And unfortunately, we don't have a state-of-the-art visitor center as yet. I don't think we've gotten one like Maryland has. But as I mentioned earlier, you know, they had 750,000 visitors in their first year of operation, um, just with the state promoting it. Um, as, I, as you mentioned earlier, I was involved with the walkway over the Hudson and they do 750,000 visitors just going to that state park alone. Uh, it's tremendous what the impacts are for a community. So if, if everybody, you know, again, I'm a historian by nature, so I love history, but I'm also an economic person. So I pitch it as an economics project, not a history project. It's all about economics. So hopefully that's answered some of the, the question there. But uh, the Empire State Development Corporation has done a lot of research in terms of the tourism office and where they invest their money. Um, many communities, um, Cuga County has done it as well. They implemented a bed tax. And so um, it was a, a project that was started probably back in the late 80s. And a lot of the communities um, were able to add an extra percent or 2% onto a hotel bill and then those out of town residents paid that money that goes into an account. That money that is, is reinvested back into the tourism office. And so it kind of creates more action, more advertisements and things like that, so. Okay. Yes, and it's, that's a great answer, Mike. There's always economic impacts and sometimes it's hard to quantify those um, and it's continual effort to, to certainly do so. Um, so all this being said, 40 years of your life uh, in front of your, your eyes for the last hour and a half, I have to ask, what's next? What projects are you working on next for this particular site? Because I know you're not done. Well, um, as I mentioned, I, uh, I do get a chance to, to be a good guest docent and do tours. Um, Again, as, a, as an old white guy giving a story about a, a black family, it's, it's kind of hard, but a lot of people come up away with an appreciation because I like to try to tell the story about how everyone has to contribute to make this a, a complete story. But right now what I'm working on with the, the Harry Tubman Home Inc. is to the actual study, the agreement between the National Park Service and the operations. So I've been a little bit involved in that. Um, I'm also involved with, I mentioned earlier, where the Norris family had carved out a quarter acre of site and they built a modern brick house on that site, which they then purchased. Um, I, um, a former Auburn resident who moved actually to Bucktown uh, down in Maryland, um, who was involved with our preservation movement back in the early 80s, bought it to save that site. Uh, unfortunately, the National Park Service, when they finished their map, they excluded that, that, that modern brick house that was part of that quarter acre. So I'm trying to work on right now uh, the appraisal process with the National Park Service on valuating the properties, uh, the brick house in particular, as well as the home for the aged. Um, and so that, that's, that's part of the complex uh, formula that the Park Service is involved with. But secondly, is to try to acquire that piece of land 
where the brick house was built that we could then turn back into Harriet's garden. So long-term, it'll probably be a 10 year process. Um, by the time you go through the assessment, you'll have to amend the boundaries of the park. We're gonna have to include that quarter acre. Then we're gonna have to find the money to tear down the house that's vacant and abandoned and it's actually falling apart. Um, it's full of water, um, although probably, you know, needs to be taken a look at and then turning it back into the landscape, which would be part of the historic and cultural sites work. So, so that's probably what I'm working on mostly right now. Um, I'm also working on a book, believe it or not. Um, I, at one point, was the city historian in Auburn, and I, for 30 years, have done a talk for Leadership Cayuga. So I only have 260 slides in my PowerPoint show for that. And I talk just, you know, two shots on, on uh, Tubman and Seward. Um, but I talk about some of the national things that have happened through the abolitionist movement, through uh, the banking industry. Um, well, I'll just throw out a couple tidbits, but uh, this guy who worked on the Erie Canal, as you know, it went right through this county and uh, Wheatsport, Port Byron, you know, they all settled there. Um, let's see. You know, he decided that uh, he was going to, you know, he's a freight agent for a contract and they would go across the state and early on they were using stagecoach and then they'd go to water, then they'd go back onto the stagecoach then. And he said, hey, you know, right now we just go to Buffalo and why don't, why don't we go out to West? You know, we got that gold rush in California. And his boss said, if you want to go to California, you start your own company. So he did. He did. So, uh. Henry Wells was his name. I don't know if you've ever heard of him. Um, but he then created a little um, uh, business and he hired this guy that worked in Auburn, um, who was the Syracuse Auburn Electric Railroad Company freight agent. Um, well, let's see, what the hell is his name? Henry Wells and um, Fargo, Bill Fargo, you ever hear of him? So Bill is working in Auburn for the uh, freight agent for the Syracuse Auburn Electric Railroad Company. Again, so the railroad is starting to take over the line and they're starting to basically replace the Erie Canal transportation route with the railroads that are now starting to fill in the gap. So Wells decides to go out west and they create this little company, uh, Wells Fargo Pony Express, you've heard of them. And they get into banking and they get into this and, and they, there were other companies that were then uh, based in Auburn as well. Um, and they created a, another subsidiary um, called uh, American Express. You ever hear of that one? So that was also based in Auburn. And so a lot of the famous people from Auburn were on their board of directors. Their attorney was, a, became a congressman from Auburn. So I've only got uh, 25 Congress people so far from Auburn that were involved in different things. So I don't know how many communities can claim that. We've had um, uh, obviously Seward, but also Enos Troop, who was a governor from Auburn and another guy who went out West, settled in uh, Utah, um, did a lot of work on the Seward house and worked on houses around here. Uh, Brigham Young, you ever hear of him? He lived here for a while as well. He lived in Port Byron, he worked on the canal. Um, so. So we talk about some of those people as well, but Ted Case, as I mentioned, sound on film and um, the agricultural designs. Uh, right now I'm chasing down the Brinkerhoff family and I only found 50 patents that they had, uh, the family had gotten over the years on barbed wire, farming implements and things like that. So, um, um, but the, the guy who you probably know that, um, um, oh, what's his name? Oh, the guy who, um, the inventor down in New Jersey. Oh, anyway, I've been to his site. It's also a national park. I try to go to all the national parks to see how they operate. Um, but um, he is the foremost uh, patents holds. Uh, number two is a guy from Auburn who invented pumps and uh, basically created the whole fire suppression system. Um, Chicago didn't use the Birdsill Holly system. Instead, they used something else and Chicago burned to the ground in 1871 and it put McCormick out of business. And then DM Osborne took over and he became one of the leaders in the agricultural business because of that. So, 
anyway, I can talk about history forever. Uh, I don't know if we have more time we need to kill or talk more questions about. But well, I did want to ask if anyone else had any other questions, uh, give our audience a chance to just jot down something in the Q&A box if you have something from Mike. Um, obviously, his love of history is is boundless. And uh, he and I have talked for hours about all these topics over many years of conference going and comparing notes. And it's, it's just amazing the history uh, that is a very, uh, uh, that is just so apparent to those of us who have been immersed in it for many years, but not so apparent to a lot of people. And to connect these stories and these connections with Auburn um, and other communities, you know, the Erie Canal was the internet of its day and, and uh, yep. the very many people who came and went and came and went are proof of that. And uh, to have this kind of history of the importance that we now recognize of Harriet Tubman is just amazing that it's not been told until recently. You know, the fact that, that even Auburn had kind of forgotten the fact that Harriet Tubman lived in that brick home and it had to be rediscovered only 40, how many, 50 years after she had passed away. So it, it often needs the history detective like you, Mike, and uh, to bring that back to the forefront and to just have so much persistence to keep it uh, going um, and to keep it uh, alive and to bring it back to the forefront of our history. And perhaps times right now have come to, to be a, a well put that this Harriet Tubman, she, she's a person that we all uh, need to learn more about. I've learned even more today, just listen, listening to you today. So well, I guess the other question too is how many people have seen the movie? Um, it's a, a very good representation. Um, personally, uh, Kate came up with a list of about 12 issues that she had with it, but you know, that's uh, creative licensing. Yeah. Um, but you know, they portrayed- it's available. Really... The, the movie's available on demand on TV, if anybody really wants to know that yeah. that's available out. And it's very, very good, very well done. Yeah, actually, uh, I, I was uh, telling our family about it. And I, you know, of course, I got to let everybody know. And so my mother-in-law went out in Arizona and found it in the movie theaters and actually physically went out and saw it. Mm -hmm. So her and the family went out in one night and saw the movie out there. But we had a premiere, as I said, in Toronto for the World Film Festival. But then they also had a premiere in Auburn. And then uh, it's been shown several times locally, too, um, as a fundraiser. So mm -hmm. it's a great show. Great movie. It gives people more of a, an appreciation for what Harriet really went through with her lifetime. So, hmm. yeah. Well, we have several comments here for you, Mike. Great job. <laughs> Fascinating. Uh, would love to learn more. Uh, going to visit Auburn very soon, as soon as possible. And I think probably a lot of us are feeling that way right now. I'd love to go back and see some things that have been done since I was there last. And uh, hopefully we'll be able to travel and hopefully that the uh, the site will not be too impacted by the uh, current uh, virus situation where fewer tourists are traveling everywhere. Uh, but sites are starting to open up again and people are wearing their masks. So we, we certainly hope that uh, things will get back on track as soon as possible. So well, I don't see I, any more questions, but do you have any final comments, Mike? Well, I can just update people on the visitation right now. Um, the historic sites, the uh, Heritage Center is open. The, the Seward House, the Willard Chapel, and the Keegan Museum are all open. Um, what they're doing is looking for people to make reservations online so that they can have small groups of people. Um, I know that the Tubman Home is not open as of yet. And so they're still working through some of their issues in terms of how to, to deal with the, the federal process um, and how to take care of it. But uh, I talked to Reverend Carter the other day and they're not open yet. Um, I did get a really nice phone call from a, an old friend in um, Oneana saying, hey, I'm going to meet my uh, a relative in, uh, you know, he's over in, in towards Rochester. They're coming this way. We're going to meet in Auburn. We, we want to go to the Tubman home. And I had to tell him, well, it wasn't open, you know, but they did go to the, the uh, Seward House and the Equal Rights Heritage Center, which is right next door. So there are things to see. So hopefully people will come. And if they... Uh, want to get their ear bent, uh, let me know and I can, if I'm back in town, I'll give them, give them some insight. So. That's great. I'm, I'm sure that Mike would be very happy to give private tours to any of us on this, on this call because we as planners, uh, we love our communities. This is why we're in the profession that we're in and it's, it's obvious that that passion just sort of oozes from you, Mike. <laughs> for, <laughs> 
there are many places where you've worked, but I think for Auburn in, in particular. So um, I don't see any more questions. So I think I'm going to say thank you very much, Mike, for a fascinating presentation, very filled with facts and great images and a lifelong story, obviously. So we also like to thank the attendees who've joined us today. Um, our next session of this virtual conference series is next Wednesday, September 30th at noon, and next Thursday, October 1st. Um, and we hope that you'll register for those and for the future upcoming sessions, which will run until November 19th. And I'd like to thank Behan Planning and Design once again. Mike mentioned them and said thank you for, for your sponsorship for today's session and our conference in general. So. With that, Mike, thank you once again. Thank you to the attendees and we'll stop the recording now and I hope to see you all again very soon online.